Females in Food. I am so excited to be joined by the founder of Nourishing Bubs, Olivia Bates. Hi, Liv. Hi there. Hi, Chelsea. Liv is a passionate paediatric dietitian and nutritionist, and it was after her experience caring for young children and love for whole foods that led to her appreciation for pro providing children with a healthy diet. And so she launched Nourishing Bubs. For those people that may not be aware of your business, Liv, can you tell them about what Nourishing Bubs is? Yes, yeah, sure, absolutely. So I guess um, the first thing that people always find interesting is I don't have children yet, although I would love to one day. Um, but I very much came at my business from a dietetic perspective. I had come out of uni and was working for a almond milk startup and basically got particularly interested in the um, baby food space as I always wanted to do something in that space. I used to want to be a pediatrician. So I sort of had a look what was in the food space. I also did some additional study into pediatric nutrition and I really sort of went out there and had a look at the food that was on offer and felt that there was really a big gap in terms of what we were saying that children needed, but what was being offered in terms of what the food industry was offering. Um, most of the food out there, as any parents will know, is primarily, um, you know, shelf-stable squeezy pouches. Um, and from my, my study around um, food practices and food manufacturing, I knew that this definitely wasn't the most nutritious option. And you recently won a really big grocery account. You've won the Woolworths, the Australian retailers business, which is really exciting. And you're in 800 retail sto uh, Woolworths stores. And how did you go about landing that first meeting with the Woolworths buyer? Yeah, so this was an interesting one. And to be honest, you know, when I started the business, I never thought I would go down the Woolworths or the Coles path. I was like, I'll go independence. But I soon realized just in a country like Australia, where it's quite small um, compared to somewhere like the States, uh, you really do need to, to, make it, to make, I think, a really big, I guess, step. You need to go down one of those big grocery chains and to get the reach, really. Um, I was just really struggling to get the reach with the independent grocers. Um, mm. And also just to establish a spot on the shelf. Like you will realise that you want to know you want to be able to direct consumers to exactly where your product was. And I was finding that because all of the independents were separately owned, that I was always having to send them to different spots. So um, in terms of getting that first meeting, um, it was very daunting, but I actually um, did it through Fine Foods and I got the opportunity to um, do a meet the buyer. Um, I mean, I don't know what's going to happen in this day and age, but obviously these shows ho hopefully will start happening again. Um, and they do often have some kind of offers around that. So I definitely always encourage people to try and, you know, if you if there's an easy way to get in front of a buyer, take that opportunity because I feel like that was my push in the right direction. I might not have gone down that path if I hadn't sort of had a bit of a kick to um, get in, in this front meeting. And basically the buyer there ended up just being a home brand buyer, but he said to me, you know, you should really just take this to head office, like, I don't want to put this in Woolworths brand. And I was like, oh, no, 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 I don't want this to go Woolworths brand either. Um, I want it to be our brand. And so he said, you know, this is the buyer you need to get in touch with. And so I um, basically found his details. And, you know, for anyone that wants to go down the Woolworths path, they're actually really, they have really great um I guess, transparency and they're very clear. So you can go onto the website, you can download the, um, the category buyers list, you can get their email, their telephone number. It is actually all available there for you to access. And so get in touch with them. I sent them a, ver him a very short email, um, but sort of to entice him and, you know, a couple of pictures of the product. And so he said, you know, give me a call. Um, I mean, I feel like I was quite lucky because he came back to me and I don't think it, it's definitely not always the case, um, but sometimes it really does, you know, it might take a bit more persistence if you know anyone that can, get, you know, put you in front of them or ask some friends, ask anyone that happens to know anyone. Um, but I definitely think that, you know, down, like for Woolworths, downloading that list, finding out who the person you need to speak to is, is a really good step in the right direction. And also finding out when they're, um, if you can, and with Woolworths, you definitely can, you can find out when their category reviews are, because that will be really, really important for you. If, you know, if they're not looking at that stage, it might not be a good time to reach out. But if their reviews coming up, you want to be making sure that you're known as well. 
Thank you. I think that, you know, for me, the summation of that is partly you need to work in with their protocols, which you did, and you were able to get their details. So I think that also takes courage and tenacity to go for it. But then also to then get that second order, what do you do, whether it had been historically with the independents or whether it's current with Woolworths, to maintain ongoing business with them? What is it that Nourishing Bubs does or that you do for Nourishing Bubs to make sure that happens? I mean, I guess that part of that is supporting them. So showing that you are doing everything you can. So, you know, as much as I can get, um, you know, the product onto the, onto the shelves, I also need to make sure that the consumers are taking it off the shelves or also consumers are asking for it. So particularly if you have a really engaged audience base. And so for us, for example, mums are really, really engaged. And um, we also use our social media channel in particular to really talk to our mums and or our parents, I should say, um, to talk to our parents and communicate with our parents um, and so they're, they're, they're also sort of batting for you and asking for you because, you know, they will go and say, oh, where is this product? And, you know, for example, because we did launch in COVID, there were some stores that hadn't put the product out straight away. And so, you know, even myself and my mother had to go into one store and say, you know, where, where's the product? It should be out. It's not here. Um, because obviously there had been some issues with supply and stuff, but, you know, your customer is also there as much as they like just they they want to get their hands on their products so they will be out there asking for you and if you say to them oh look if you can't find it just go and speak to the staff and ask them i think it's really about you know maintaining open open communication both with your consumer and then also for me for my buyer if i'm worried about things or you know if i feel like you know things are not working or if you know we had issues where the website wasn't showing our products so how can you know customers buy it if the website is not up and running so it's making sure all of those making sure the journey for the consumer is as easy as possible so that you know they're not saying i can't access it i can't find it so they end up buying something else i think it's you know very much communicating but creating a good positive relationship so i mean i know i am a small fish in Woolworths sea of products so i'm always very polite i understand that their time is very important and so just making sure that you are respectful of the fact that you know you are one of so many products that they're dealing with so as much as you do want to get things done be as polite and um i guess concerned about their time as they are and know that you know they're also doing you a favor um but still stand up for yourself as well so if you feel like you mm. know things are not working say look I'm trying really hard here. And if you can ex exemplify to them, be like, you know, we're doing all of these ads, we're pushing all of these people, but there's a block here. They will understand that you're putting everything into it. So it's very much about open communication between all mm -hmm. aspects. I think it's important to be a business partner rather than just a supplier. And that's to me what you just described, that you're not self-centred or self-centric you know, I think a lot of small producers sometimes can think that, you know, they have the best product, which often they may, but the buyer is super busy and is being pitched to all the time. And so if you can add value to their life by being more than just being, I mean, you talk about being polite and being um, uh, organized and deliver in full and on time and all of that stuff, but also show that you're adding value, which I want to just pivot to, if I may, with oh. regards to, marketing so you have this incredibly engaged uh, mother or parent community so what steps or tips and tricks could you share with the females in food community around how you've got them engaged over time so that you because you are creating the pull through in store or the demand from those parents for your product which is awesome but how do you also have that push message out there, no doubt using social media, et cetera, et cetera? I'm just wondering if you can share with us a couple of things. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, 
this has been a lot of, I think, trial and error as well. So um, pre-COVID, we used to do quite a lot of, I guess the benefits for me is that I have a paediatric dietitian background. So we used to do a lot of talks and, um, you know, in person where I would go and talk to mothers groups. And so just be educating them purely on, obviously, like introducing solids, which is where our product, product comes in. Um, and I found that that to be very useful. Also, um, you know, doing things like um, asking questions on social media, letting them ask, ask, ask us questions on me so I can go online and do, you know, um, a- answer people's questions. Um, you know, if they ask for recipes, one thing people really want is recipes to utilise the product. Um, so showing them how they can use the products and making it as easy as possible. So I understand that, you know, my group, the my customer base obviously they want things that are convenient and easy so they prefer things like you know three ingredient recipes and things like that it's what makes their life as easy as possible so it's no point going and giving them you know a really complicated 20 ingredient recipe it's making it's sort of hitting that nail on the head repeatedly where you're making life as easy as possible and just adding on and adding on um Also, other things that work, I think, are like um, collaborations with, you know, companies that share, um, you know, share your values, share your consumer base. You know, we did a Mother's Day competition and that worked amazingly well for us where, you know, you go and follow all of these groups and then, you know, we found we had really great pickup, all these people. Um, It is an amazing time where, you know, I think parents more than ever are on their phones. Um, um, And so you do have a more engaged Um, consumer base Um, a lot of it for me is definitely education I think offering education Um, tapping into like groups on Facebook is really appealing to a particular demographic is there is there Facebook groups around that or um, you know can you sort of leverage leverage something like that? Obviously, you know, if someone's doing like a, um, a dairy-free ice cream, you know, maybe trying to tap into a, a consumer base that are all, you know, whether they're um, vegans or, you know, finding out who your consumer is and just trying to tap into that and making sure you do partner with appropriate, appropriate type people, I guess. Um, so that's, yeah, quite a, yeah, trying to find where your audience, where they're hanging out, what they're, what, what they're also looking at um, is really helpful. Thanks, Liv. I, I love that you talk about, uh, you know, and what I talk about in the Foodpreneurs Formula, my program, the marketing uh, funnel, really. You've given so many great clues as to what you can do if you think about that marketing funnel of driving awareness, interest, desire and action where somebody actually buys your product. I think that uh, collaborations are fantastic because they have like audience but non-competing. So that's part of the driving awareness stage. And then the education piece that you talk so strongly about, which I love, for me generates interest so people can actually imagine what they need to do with your product without you pushing your brand per se onto them. So females in food... (laughs) pause and re-listen to all of that because when I taught marketing funnel um, Liv just gave incredible examples of how you move your prospect or your target audience through the funnel so that from an awareness stage to drive interest desire and ultimately for them to buy your stuff whether it's a product or a service if we can look at the insights into certain things that we've done in the past that may not have worked the way we hoped they would work that's the key, I think, for good business people like you. So what's a one mistake, so to speak, that you've made or has been made with your business that you wish you could have done it differently, but you've, of course, learned from it? <laughs> I mean, I know I'm sure I have made so many. Um, I think I wish, to be honest, I really wish when I went to Woolworths that I had a larger um, a larger range. That's one thing I really wish. Um, I do find, you know, with Woolworths, for example, and I think maybe this is impacted also by um, COVID, but, you know, the review is now only once every year. So, you know, I would love to launch some new products now, but I've now got to wait till like March next year because that's when the review is. So, and then if I didn't have those ready, then I would, I would miss the boat. So I do wish because I find we don't have a lot of presents on shelf. Like we've got two SKUs in there. I, I did have three. They only initially started two. I wish I'd had slightly like not just the purees. I wish I had um, 
I guess, some products that appeal to like a slightly older audience. And I mean, that sort of leads into, you know, what's next for Nourishing Bugs. But um, I do wish we really had a had a larger range because I do feel like our audience is a little bit stuck in that really, you know, that tiny, it's got a short life cycle. Like inevitably we have a short life cycle with our current range of products as much as obviously, you know, I do give people recipes and ways that they can expand the shelf life, uh, sorry, the, um, the life cycle of our product. It does ultimately really end by, you know, a year of age. So I do wish I had gone with a, with a bigger range, but I guess part of it also was, it was a whole new thing for me, like trying to worse. It was not, it was not probably part of my initial plan. So I wasn't probably as prepared. I was in a rush to get this, the products updated for Woolies. So I, yeah, I probably didn't have as much time up my hands, to, up, yeah, on my sleeves to do that. But I would recommend, you know, having diversified range. And for two reasons, are you presenting there? One, because then you could have more facing. So for those listening who may not know what either of us mean, it means so like say you've got currently you've got two two um products on the shelf well one 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 two different SKUs SKUs on the shelf and it'd be great to have a third to take up more space so to speak but then also that other piece around your niching yes or for North American people who are listening out your niche um you are very specifically targeting that first year of life and so you're the you know, I guess you're aiming to be leaders in that one year of life, but then how do you have, like, when you're thinking about your customer life cycle and yeah. investment, wouldn't it be great to have food for, say, a child who's, I don't know, what, 10 to 3 or 10 to uh, 2 till 5, yeah. something yeah, like that? Yeah, 5, so yes, so, baby, you know, um, something that expands. Because, because then you got, you know, you then have theoretically, like, five years of life cycle rather than, you know, rather than just um, that, you know, eight months theoretically. So I understand. And such good for women listening, doing your market assessment at the beginning and trying to ascertain how big that market is, is crucial. Sometimes it's super difficult. Liv Bates, thank you so much. Your sharing of the information today has been really, really helpful. Thank you so much. Females in foods, uh, I feel really privileged because Liv is a very busy woman at the moment. Well, always as a business owner, but going from strength to strength. So if you've liked this interview and if you've got something from it today that sparked an idea or um, for you and your business, please show your appreciation by liking it um, and comment below. You know, it is um being a foodpreneur is fabulous, but not always easy. So I like to always encourage everybody to show them what they've got from the interviews because being a foodpreneur can sometimes be a lonely pursuit. So it's good for foodpreneurs to know that they're not alone. So I hope wherever you are in the world, you and your business, are, you are well and safe. Bye for now. <laughs>